there's some sort of assessment, I think you should already give me like three points because this has got to be the worst spot in the day. And I really appreciate that everyone is still here. So I'm going to stand here and move around a bit just to keep you kind of focused. Um, I did ask whether there were Friday night drinks being served during my session, but apparently not. Um, so thank you very much and thank you for the speakers prior to me as well. Um, I, I, in particular, I know that last session really interested me as someone who's come out of the business world to hear and think about that analysis is fantastic and I know Gillian Triggs at the Australian Human Rights Commission is very passionate about human rights and business and in fact it's one of the whole commission's key priorities as well. So that's good to know. I'm going to really give you a whirlwind tour on um, gender equality from the Human Rights Commission's perspective. Uh, I'll, I'll cover those three priorities that I've identified, talk about what a primary prevention approach is, and then really talk about a couple of projects, but particularly one in universities at the moment, um, just to get you up to speed. And I probably won't talk for too long. I'll be able to get there pretty fast and um, it will probably hit you just as well in a shorter version. Um, so just starting, having started the role of Sex Discrimination Commissioner in April of this year, there was this big request, uh, there was this sort of great expectation, I think Liz Broderick did such an amazing job and really got gender equality, uh, she and actually years of other really fantastic activists have finally got gender equality as a mainstream discussion. And so when she wasn't re replaced as of August last year, there was a whole lot of uh, daily media stories that you all read that were without a spokesperson to answer about whether that particular sports person was appropriate in what they were doing. And when, so when I started, there was this massive request for me to talk and identify what I was going to do. And uh, in reality, um, when you start a new job, you know, all the books say you spend the first three months listening and learning and getting the lie of the land. Um, but there, that, wasn't an, that wasn't on offer for me. And the reality was when I started, I knew that for 25 years I've been thinking about this issue and probably for 48 years, in fact, as a, as a, a woman. Um, and so I did have some views. Um, but having said that, I've started this role very much wanting to hear more views and if you watch out on the website and see some comms going forward, my next six months is to really talk deeply about some of the issues that we think are out there and particularly for me to really look at the different experience of inequality for different groups of women. Uh, women, unlike some of the other groups, as someone said, um, women are the only disadvantaged group that's not a minority and in fact women contain women with disabilities, Aboriginal women, multicultural women, LGBTI women and a whole older women, younger women. So there's such a different experience um, in terms of human rights uh, for uh, women generally and then gender equality all ex also extends to the experience for men. Uh, particularly men who don't follow a sort of a hetero, um, white heteronormative uh, model. Uh, so, just to give you an idea, I did start and I did come out pretty early and say, uh, I think I'm controversially, here are three issues that I know as a country we are still doing very badly at. <coughs> and the first one, which has um, pleasingly in Victoria had a lot of focus, uh, particularly with strong advocacy from Rosie Batty to raise it to a more high profile area, but again, from strong advocacy for many years, from a lot of people, which is violence against women. And when we look at those statistics, they are at all ends of the spectrum. It is sexual violence generally, it is family violence, and it is also just daily experiences of sexual harassment, where one in four women and one in six men say that in the workplace they're dealing with sexual harassment. One in three women since the age of 15 have experienced physical violence and one in five sexual violence. So these statistics are alarming and really, um, like the previous speakers, when you turn your eyes to this problem, uh, to think that we live in a community where that is the daily experience for so many of us, that is really alarming and needs to change. The second key priority that I have identified that lets me 
cover a whole lot of things is looking at women's lifetime economic security. And this is really um, that compounding effect of women's economic power. Um, so looking through at the impacts of pay inequality of uh, different work experience underrepresentation in the workplace, um, more casualised and insecure employment, lower superannuation, and over a lifetime, meaning that women are retiring with half the savings, the retirement savings of men, and twice as likely to live in poverty. And so the solution to that is complex, but that is something that also needs to change. And the third focus that I've got is looking at women in decision-making roles. Uh, often that ends up in stats out of the ASX about how many CEOs and how many women on boards, and I, I agree that that's important. But actually, if you look across our whole community, women, even in areas where they are most um, significantly affected, still are not in the key decision-making positions and their voices are still not being heard properly in community, in government, um, in organisations, even female dominated sectors, are still being largely led by men. And that is not to say that men don't have important voices, but women have important voices as well. So those are the three priorities I've arrived to the Commission really focused on. Um, but in addition, also with a really strong interest in understanding better the different experiences of different groups of men and women um, across our community. So I've arrived here as a lawyer who, uh, like many people in this room, have had a long career in the law and probably an over-optimistic um, view of the, uh, the positive outcomes that can be produced by good laws. Uh, because when I was growing up, um, those laws, the sex discrimination laws, the Victorian Equal Opportunity Act were introduced in the 70s and 80s and I think and I look at Melinda because we're at uni together and we knew that this wasn't going to be a problem for us because that um, that is done the laws have got it right they recognize that discrimination is wrong it's unlawful there are consequences and um, things will be different uh, the reality is jump forward to now and those stats I've told you are the stats now they're not the stats from the 70s and that story is actually tells us that we haven't really achieved the change that I think we assumed laws alone would deliver to us. So in coming to this role, and particularly for my last five years experience, um, I have really learned about, more about what a primary prevention approach would look like. Recognising that the laws are important but they're not sufficient on their own. And so in terms of um, helping you, if you're not deeply involved with gender equality, and I don't think most people, in fact, are, to just jump you forward and say, okay, what's the now thinking? How can you um, understand what's going on when you read things in the newspaper and you think, why are they arguing about this? Is that a lot of my thinking has been informed by particularly work in family violence. Vic Health has done some amazing work in recent times, which, um, has started off the back of family violence, identifying what is the actual cause of the, this problem. And the finding has been the cause is gender inequality. And the cause isn't alcohol or drugs, although they are contributors, and the cause isn't that someone had an affair and they were really angry or mental health issues. The cause is that basically, inherently in our society, in a whole range of places, Women are valued less than men, and there is an unequal uh, sharing of power, of opportunity, and of resources. And that if we could um, bring that back, if we could get equality, then we would actually eradicate much family violence. But in fact, if we could get equality, we could also deal with those other issues that I've identified. That, that would increase uh, economic security for women, which would help our broader community and that would um, show a different map of our organisations where men and women and all different types of community members would have a say and we would get better decisions. So, so I have been really, and this is my, you know, for you people who are really Friday afternoon want to think what are you going to do on the weekend, um, I've been really, or in some ways that my thinking has kind of come around 
to um, some work that was done with Vic Health, our watch, and Anne Rose, the National Research Body on Family Violence, called Change the Story. So if you haven't looked at this, I really encourage you to look at it, and they've done some great infographics there. Um, but it's a really good way of talking about what is the multi um, faceted way we need to really break down what are the systemic and attitudinal barriers that live in our community to really change the underlying factors that lead to gender inequality. That thinking talks about what are the gender stereotypes that, uh, that still continue to exist, um, how are the ways that we interact, what are the things that live in our organisations um, that are working against our good intentions in terms of gender equality. And in some ways that bit of work came out simultaneously with some work that um, I was doing. I've seen some colleagues from the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission. We did some work with Victoria Police. And for me, that was the sort of turning point for me as someone who had used the sex discrimination laws for many years to hold organisations to account and to question you know, what they were doing to advance equality. My realisation when we did this work with Victoria Police uh, was that the way they had been trying to deliver gender equality and prevent sex discrimination, sexual harassment and predatory behaviour was to set some rules, get some training done, almost always online, and then expect the victims to get the courage to bring complaints to hold the perpetrators to account in a system that was excruciating and that really spent more time looking at the rights of the perpetrator than the welfare of the victim. So that experience made me realise that the system that the laws have delivered in fact focus on not preventing the conduct occurring but requiring individuals who themselves are usually vulnerable to enforce the laws and that won't work. So that piece of work really uh, did use a lot of that big health thinking of saying, when you talk prevention, uh, prevention is try you know, with the objective of stopping uh, these conduct before it happens. Um, but you can also, in, part of that is response, and you need to respond well, and you need to hold people to account. But in fact, the most important work is in the prevention, as is in changing those circumstances that le lead to the uh, conduct occurring in the first place. So uh, I think the title of my topic in fact came from that Change the Story. It's, it's talking about changing um, the, our community where we live, work, play and sleep. I think I'm going to get that right. Live, learn, work and play. And the idea of that is that we can't, well for me that converts into, I can't change every bit of our community because gender inequality in fact lives right across our community. It's not something that's just in surgeons, it's not just something in police, it's not just in ADF, it's not just in banking, it's not just in every other sector that you can think of, it's everywhere. Um, so the work that, or the, the approach that I've brought to the work that I'm doing is to pick a few key settings for change and then really try to focus on them with the idea that they might have a big enough impact that it will create a bigger change. And so the three places I have chosen, which won't really be surprising, number one is looking at workplaces. So particularly, um, or in fact at all levels, uh, but if you think about violence, sexual harassment, sexism, pre preventing that in workplaces, if you think about the pay gap, if you think about access to paid parental leave, childcare, um, also un unshared, unfair sharing of unpaid caring responsibilities, if you think about superannuation, all of those things that go to those three issues that we are really bad at can be significantly changed by our workplaces. And one of the initiatives, but certainly not the only one, is chairing that Victorian Male Champions of Change group. The second area I've chosen is sport. And sport, whilst is not a huge number of place where a lot of complaints are made about human rights breaches or gender inequality. The reality is sport has such a huge reach. It reaches so many parts of our community at a grassroots level through to an elite level. Uh, it has uh, parents on the sideline of the soccer games, volunteers, we've got supporters, we've got players. 
So this, it has such a big impact, particularly in Victoria, I must say, when I go around the country and I'm introduced that I'm a Carlton board member, they don't boo with me on the states like they do here. Um, but I know in Victoria there's something different about how we feel about sport, in a good way, but there's also some really concerning things. So, so sport for me is a really important place that we should really be turning our attention to because of the impact it can have to make change. And the third place that I'm doing a piece of work is in universities. I, I really do have a very strong uh, view that the, um, the, the idea that this is a problem that's going to be sorted out through generational change Again, Melinda and I, we were the generation that that was going to be sorted out. It didn't work. Um, and in fact, what we know is the research says that 18 to 24 year olds have some of the most concerning attitudes. Uh, that group has a greater expectation that men should control relationships, a much stronger view, a much uh, more concerning violence supportive attitudes, much greater preparedness to excuse trivialise um, or even condone violence supportive attitudes and blame the victim. So we know that kind of this isn't something that's just going to flush through the system because in fact from when we're born there are stereotypes about who does what. Just as in sport boys, you know, are sporty and active and girls are pretty, uh, that we know that that is through our community. And the reason I'm focusing on universities is really because of some really great activism um, and a spotlight that has started in the US. So some of you might have seen some really concerning recent coverage about some rapes at Stanford University. But in fact, it's now come out here, there's a movie called The Hunting Ground that I'm sure people here are at any universities. It's been screened at many universities. Um, and I understand it is going to be screened for everyone on SBS coming up soon. It's a movie that was a documentary produced in 2014 off the back of a number of women in U US universities who all simultaneously discovered they had been raped or sexually assaulted, particularly in their early days of their starting at university. And when they had gone to get help, they were basically ignored and quietened. And, and in fact, in many ways, because of the power of the um, philanthropy in the US, that those very prestigious universities did not want those stories to come out and they were not provided with any support. So through activism, some very um, talented and very dedicated women started being prepared to talk to others about their story. And they found how many people had the same experience and this movie is a documentary about it. Um, it's come to Australia and in fact, um, the word of it coming was here last year. And as a result of that movie coming to Australia, the vice chancellors in Australia have had to really consider, is this an issue that they are facing? And the initial response, I think really was, well, we don't have the same system here. We don't all have residential colleges. They all, uh, we don't have sororities. We don't have sporting cultures where these um, uh, sporting heroes <coughs> are treated as gods and uh, this misbehaviour happens. Uh, but the reality is, having talked to some of those vice chancellors and some of the people in residential colleges, is they have said, we do know this happens here. We know that we have concerns. We just don't know what the nature of it is. We don't know how we're going. Lots of those universities have, have systems in place to take complaints. Some don't, but the majority of them do. But um, having now spoken to more women than I would have ever imagined I would have to speak to about their experiences of sexual assault, their responses are, when it happened, I had no idea where to go. And they were Googling and they were trying to work out what they should do. So what has happened is in Australia, the uh, universities of Australia have got, they, they are kind of the head body for the 39 universities. And all 39 vice chancellors have agreed to engage the Human Rights Commission to do a survey to really get um, some really clear factual information about the experience of university students in Australia. Now we know off the back of a national university, um, national union of students survey that 
that survey told us that uh, something like a quarter of students who responded had been sexually assaulted and something like three quarters had experienced sexual harassment or some sort of unwelcome sexual behaviour, not always at university but during their time in these institutions. That suggests an incredibly high prevalence. Um, our survey will be more comprehensive going to every university but it will tell us about the prevalence but also the experiences in terms of response, how effective those systems are and really give the university some better guidance on how to um, deal with those issues. That survey, and I guess to mention to you as well, will provide information about support and counselling. Uh, I've noticed in the conversations about this, some of these victims have sort of almost told me it, as if they're guilty that I haven't um, reported this, as if that's their responsibility and they've let down the side. And I think often that is the response when you find that a perpetrator who's assaulted you went on at the next party to assault someone else. Uh, but in reality, the first step should be looking after the welfare of these people. So as a starting point, certainly people can come to the Commission, but we're spending a lot of time saying you can go to police and you can call 1-800-RESPECT. There are places you can go and it shouldn't feel so complicated to you. So that's just giving you an idea of one of the projects that we're working on and one of the places that we think change might be able to happen. Um, that's a pretty heavy point to leave you on, on a Friday night. Um, but I just encourage you in closing to have a look at the Change the Story as a, as a different way of thinking about the pursuit of gender equality to give you an idea of sometimes why when we get um, ridiculous conversations on Triple M, why everyone's talking about it in a particular way and why it's really important that we speak up and that we don't just sort of say it was a joke and not worry about it, why those things actually do matter. So thank you very much for your attention. I completely agree with you about the causes of family violence being gender and inequality, but that seems to be quite divisive um, in terms of the way that's received by the public. It can also be quite alienating um, for men who are at the receiving end of violence and members of the LGBTI community. I've been thinking about what this, what this means because fundamentally I do agree with you, but I wonder if you had any thoughts about whether we need to dig a little bit deeper and sort of look at um, misogyny and, dare I say, the patriarchy rather than gender inequality as the cause, gender inequality being a symptom of those two other deeper things. And whether we might need a different language about that in terms of moving forward with this issue. Really fantastic insight, because I think gender um, inequality is a really kind of wrap up the ball term. And in terms of thinking behind it, um, the experience of, uh, it's, it's about a kind of a white Anglo, male heteronormative, very, so there's a whole lot of men and women who don't fall into that. And so in fact, um, that is very much a part of the conversation and that idea of gender equality is about women and, or about uh, just women versus men, that isn't sort of the position that I start from at all. Um, it is about a particular patriarchal, historical stereotype that seems to have run the show for a very long time. Um, so yeah, I'm really interested in that thinking, absolutely. Do we have a final question? Oh, and I might just add to that, because there's something else you said too. And one of the things about the Change the Story and also the police project, and I think we're seeing it in um, Team Sue Pomisan, there's a couple of us that, that all kind of are getting together and looking at at social media isn't the cause but the backlash. So that change the story really talks about you as we make progress, the backlash is just, you know, venomous. And um, and it is something that you almost have to prepare yourself for. It's quite depressing when it seems such a no-brainer that we should be moving forward in this way. Um, but that backlash that seems to be getting um, 
I think, in terms of LGBTI progress, in terms of gender equality, in terms of race and religious you know, rights. Um, the backlash is just getting more and more, and it's, it's, and then it has a vehicle for um, proliferation through social media, so I'm really conscious of that too. Somewhere. Hello. Um, I just want to um, raise with you where I've been a bit frustrated with the, um, the talk about women's rights and gender equality. And I, and I like to say I really do um, agree with what was just said there about the importance of talking about patriarchy, because I'm feeling in this country, we're not talking about patriarchy, but there's still, feminists in the United States are still using the term patriarchy, particularly um, Gloria Steinem. But also, where I, where I get frustrated is, I feel like there's the elephant in the room. I feel like adult pornography is still not being seen um, to be harmful, even though there's research out there linking it to violence. Um, the United States Supreme Court, um, or Court of Appeal back in 1985, acknowledged that images of subordination can perpetuate subordination, and accepted that pornography um, had a role to play in violence in the home, as well as on the street, for women and for children. I'm concerned that, um, you know, in today's age we still have strip clubs, Iceland has banned strip clubs. Iceland has introduced a naughty model to deal with prostitution because it also sees it as an area that perpetuates um, the subordination of women and that view of women in society. Um, it attempted to ban online pornography back in 2013, but there was a change of government, but it saw, it saw the harm of that as well as already having a, a, a ban generally on pornography. Um, and also, the Court of Appeal in the US in 1985 said that um, the images of subordination can also be linked with economic inequality. So the three areas that you're talking about can actually feed into each other, aren't necessarily seen as separate. And I think these are really important issues. I don't understand why we're not looking, revisiting the possibility of an internet filter, if it can be made sure that it doesn't affect innocent websites. I don't understand why we're not looking at campaigns to raise awareness about the harm of pornography for men to be thinking through the consequences of viewing that material. There's the rising problem of pornography addiction. Um, all of these issues that I feel like the Nordic countries are way ahead of us and we're still not talking about it up front um, and really putting it on the table as this is a really, these are really serious issues. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for that, and I'm really interested in that thinking. That conversation, just so you know it's not, not non-existent, was a conversation I've already had. So at the moment, as part of uh, the national COAG agenda, there's a national action plan on the prevention of violence <coughs> against women. And in the conversation for the next, the third national action plan, which goes from this year to 2018, um, the conversation about sexual violence, I know there's some very passionate people within um, government who agree with you in terms of pornography and why are we looking at that and really want to focus on that. My, my, I would expand what you're saying because I actually think there is pornography but I have got young children and I just look at advertising and I think, so I, I put that on a spectrum Definitely. of how, you know, there is pornography at one end but actually the everyday socially acceptable billboards um, and things that are available on social media, games, all of those things send very concerning messages. So I, I agree with you on that, and I think it's a really important And if sexism could be added as a criteria to be considered by the Advertising um, Standards Bureau, because apparently at the moment it isn't, and so there is sexist ads that are able to go through yeah. that the board is saying, but it doesn't breach our codes. Fantastic. Okay, well I've heard all that and Angela, my advisor, is right here and because I'm really early days in terms of thinking of what are the issues. I've been told we have time for one more question if anyone wants to get in another question before we wrap up. Very late. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, before uh, Sarah Joseph comes to um, end the conference today, please join me in thanking Kate for a fabulous <laughs>